Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen from my side. Thank you very much, Fidelius Götz, for this kind introduction and for inviting me to this discussion tonight. Thank you both for being here. I'm looking forward to a very relevant, very interesting de uh, debate. I don't know if it's a debate, let's call it a discussion uh, for now, but we'll see where it goes. I'd like also to thank Nico Luchsing of Asia Society Switzerland, who did extensive research and work in preparing this evening and in preparing myself, since China, unfortunately, is rarely, if ever, discussed on Swiss television. So just assume that I don't know anything about the subject, <laughs> and these guys know everything, which basically is a good way to start. And I would like to start with the topic that uh, Mr. Goetz has mentioned already, which has dominated the news in the last couple of weeks, which was also a big subject this week because of the UN General Assembly, and this obviously is North Korea. North Korea is also one of the fault lines, I think, between the US and China right now, because China seems unwilling or unable to do what the US expects, specifically to put economic pressure on North Korea. Why does China not do this, Mr. Shell? Well, I think it remains to be seen uh, exactly how far China will ultimately go. And they might still. They it's, might. it's still possible. Uh, and remember that uh, our uh, American president, Donald Trump, uh, is going to go to China in November. And uh, I think if we sort of plot the progress of, of uh, China, in terms of its willingness to, to put pressure on the North, we see incremental steps uh, uh, with each sanction that the UN has imposed that China has agreed to. And I think, uh, paradoxically here, we, we look at North Korea and we think of it, it being as an utterly insoluble problem, and indeed it is quite insoluble. However, I think over the last three or four or five years, it would be fair to say that there has been a, a greater recognition on part of China that its interests overlap with those of the United States. China does not want to see a nuclear armed North Korea any more than we do. However, they have other, other issues, they have other questions, they have other concerns. They do not want to see a unified Korea, they do not want to see American troops just across the Yalu River. But it will remain to be seen, in, 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 in my view, whether Trump can actually deliver on the thing he says he's best at, which is making a deal. We'll see. And when he goes to China, it is imaginable, because the interests are not completely divergent, that they could, could kind of divide Asia up, and Trump and Xi could, could come to some uh, deal where she would help out more. And what can, what can she do? Well, he could shut down all rail traffic to North Korea. Nobody's talked about that yet. That would be a big, uh, uh, big source of pressure. He could close down the airlines, which fly to Beijing, from Beijing to Pyongyang, the main route in and out of the country. He could shut down the oil pipeline. He could shut down all of the local bank banks in Manchuria, uh, across the Yalu River that, that facilitate trade. So it could happen. Would it be enough to turn North Korea around? I doubt it. But it might be enough to, if the US were then willing to open a diplomatic door to a settlement which probably wouldn't disarm North Korea, but might control further nuclear development. So it could we, raise the pressure. They would have the leverage. I doubt it a little. I'm a little more, more skeptical about that, whether China really wants I don't to predict join, this about wants to I only join this, this kind it. of policy that the US administration <laughs> is pursuing presently, because North Korea is still very useful to China, very useful How? as a kind of buffer How? state, as a state that is um, kind of um, out of control, uh, outside of the control of the United States, actually. It's a buffer, a classical buffer state, and um, at the same time, I think that obviously the Chinese leadership doesn't like what's happening, because this isn't like an unruly adolescent, you know, really moving around without, in uncontrolled ways. And um, this is something what obviously is not um, loved in Beijing, but still, I mean, if you see the, the maneuvers, the diplomatic maneuvers by Russia and China in some, in a coordinated way even, uh, at least in some instances, then you see that interests are still very different. And the other issue, I think you pointed at that, North Korea wants to go nuclear. 
they want to have a weapon. That's the aim, obviously, yeah, of uh, Kim Jong-un, to, to have a, a missile system that can carry a nuclear yeah, rocket to the United States. This is the ultimate kind of blackmailing instrument that he needs in his hand to sustain the regime. So it's really a, it's really a cancer in the central nervous system of, of the Asia-Pacific, I think. We won't get rid of that. It's really difficult. And let's I, see. I, I think, you know, you have to look at it, though, from the perspective of uh, President Trump. He is desperate for some sure. big success, a big deal. Let's just say he goes to Beijing and he says to Xi, listen, and he's already said this uh, in regard to trade, you give us a deal in North Korea, mm. we'll lighten up on trade. And there is a lot of inequity in the trade balance with the U.S. He could also say, you know, listen, you and I get together here on North Korea. We squeeze them. We'll open the door. We'll get a peace treaty for the Korean mm. War. And listen, don't worry about the South China Sea. Don't worry about Taiwan. Don't worry about Hong Kong. You know, that's, you know, they could come to some sort of a capo to capo type of a deal. Mm. It's perfectly within Trump's uh, ability to do that. Is it within Xi's ability? That's more problematic. Why I, would it not be in his I ability think he's to, a do, big to take the steps that you mentioned before with the oil pipeline, First of all, with the trains? I think he's smart enough not to trust yeah. Trump. Uh, <laughs> but second of all, Correct. I think he, he, is, he is not a big gambler. He's not a mm. risk taker. No. He's not a game changer. No. No, that's a strategist. He's a strategist, really taking the long view, playing a long game there. So this is not something that can be solved within one year, yeah, mm -hmm. from the Chinese perspective. To solve it in a sustainable, durable way, they have to be much more patient. Mm -hmm. This is it. Maybe but they find other solutions for the Kim Jong-un problem. I don't know. Yeah, There are certainly several options on the table on the Chinese side. Yeah? If so they that. raised the pressure, if they cut off these uh, supplies, what would happen in North Korea? Would, would the regime collapse at a certain point? China would have refugees? I don't borders? think it would right away, but I think you'd have Mac, you, you would have exerted, the world would know that China had done what it could do. Okay. And from there on in, we would have to make other uh, decisions and arrangements. Is there a certain shift happening? In the last weeks or months in China, are those forces it's hardening? That want to rhetorics, have the rhetorics are hardening. The public debate on North Korea is clearly hardening. So the support for it is. for shifting this um, the, the the support for yeah, for actually reducing support for North Korea is clearly there. The public debate has changed. Yes, okay. obviously. Yeah, think tanks are a little yeah, more right. independent in their views, and I think there are a lot of Chinese. You you, you speak to them, and they they think Kim Jong Un is really. A day, it's like having some crazy relative locked right, in the attic. You can't yeah, get away, and, you, mm. he, he, and, and they don't like it any more than we do. Okay, that's at least good news, and you would say that in November we might actually see some development on this front. No. Uh, God only knows. I, I mean, you know, as an American, I have to tell you, I, I don't you think never it's know easy to predict what he'll do. You never know when the next tweet is going to go off, right? I will say one thing about Donald Trump. He is a very flexible man in the sense that he... Uh, occupies both sides of every contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. From a security policy perspective, obviously North Korea is the most press pressing issue at hand for the US and for Europe. But from an economic perspective concerning China, it's not. I'd like to delve tonight into the subject that Mr. Goetz has also mentioned, into the Chinese foreign direct investments that we see all over the world. We see it in Europe, we see it in Switzerland with Syngenta, I think you've mentioned it before. Uh, Camp China has bought it for, what was it? $44 billion? That's even correct, more, right? right? $44 more. billion? Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Hammer, you've been very critical about those transactions in the past. Please, if you care to explain to me why, because in the end, this is just free market at work. Or you must it? know your investors, that's the first thing. You must know the people you are playing with. And um, Chem China is a highly leveraged, not well-run, state-owned conglomerate in China, which doesn't um, seem to be the best partner already from f at first sight, actually, for Syngenta, which is a powerhouse, an innovation powerhouse with global reach and so forth. So this is something that uh, we should consider. There are other considerations based on the experience with Chinese industrial investors that they are really interested in making these industrial firms they acquire successful globally, but more importantly in the Chinese market. That's the opportunity for Syngenta. That's the other part of the story, the business part of the story. But the Syngenta deal in a way is less 
terrifying because there's a state guarantee behind it. So a default or, or serious financial issues with um, Camp China, the partner of Syngenta, are not likely presently. We have other cases, you know that, especially the HNA case. This is more interesting. The Hainan Airlines Group, HNA, walking around in Europe and acquiring stakes in, in all sorts of companies, from Swissport to Deutsche Bank, tried Allianz in Germany, they, they, they failed with this, but now they are here running around doing things. So and yesterday, I think there was this uh, warning from your investment oversight commission that they want to know who these investors are because they can't trace them. And even, to be frank, even Chinese state banks sometimes have real difficulties to find out what the private investors, what the networks are that are behind major private investments in Europe. So that's something that we really have to push for. One thing, transparency, seen through the network of the um, investors that are coming here is extremely, this is the precondition for making any deal. And I think we were very sloppy in Europe and also, frankly, in Switzerland, in some cases, there. Yeah, we should. More transparency, more scrutiny, more screening. Clearly, we must know who is investing. The other um, thing is that the chemical market is not open to our companies in China. How do we deal with that? They come here by our, acquire our companies, but we can't go there and acquire theirs. This is not good, clearly, simple. It's not a level level playing field, it's a tilted playing field. There has to be much more coordinated pressure in Europe actually, including Switzerland, from coming from the EU and Switzerland, to open up those branches of the economy in China that are closed presently. It's not fair, simply. It's not fair. We can't accept that. Until the level, uh, the, the playing field is leveled again, we should just block these investments? Should we have we, we don't have the instruments for doing that because we are open. Yeah, we are, have open and markets, and we, uh, right? And no, we are clearly. This is something that we support. But the um, assumption was when China um, joined the WTO, the World Trade Organization, two thousand and one, that it would open up naturally. Yeah, it would kind of play by our rules, play by the rules that were established in the WTO, actually. And there are doubts about that now because they didn't open up some of the the, the core and most exciting branches, also like insurance industry, important for Swiss, for Swiss companies, also. Um, so there are many big problems there, and, and they must be put on the table. Should we revert? I mean, this question of a level playing field is a real one, and it is a, a, a question that every open economy, and I, I, I think that uh, America has, itself has profited greatly by being an open economy, but we now have the disadvantage of jousting with an economy that isn't open. And as Sebastian has suggested, there are whole areas that are no-fly zones in terms of investments, telecom, media, uh, we're just shut out of them. So th that's a question of reciprocity that really needs a, so a diplomatic remedy, it seems to me, for us to have a good relation, and us as Switzerland, the EU, America, whomever. Uh, the other thing is, it's important to remember that, you know, there are two kinds of companies in China. One is state-owned enterprises that bought Syngenta. Uh, the other is so-called private enterprises. And we've had of late, and these are the people that you, you hear about insofar as you hear about Chinese businessmen. I mean, you may know about Alibaba, you may know about Forsun, uh, Fuxing, or this guy, uh, Wanda, who buys all the movie theaters and movie studios and has, is the richest man in China. Of late, just to Put it very simply, uh, uh, a lot of these well-known entrepreneurs who seem to be quite indestructible and fabulously wealthy, Hainan Airways, uh, HNA, running around the world grabbing companies left and right, a few billion here, a few billion there, they have run into a lot of trouble, not only because they are, they're over-leveraged, but also because they're starting to be investigated by the Chinese Communist Party for corruption and, and strange deals. Uh, now, why are they being uh, investigated? We don't know. But so that is a very spongy foundation on which to have your company purchased and uh, uh, annealed onto, let's say, Hainan Airways uh, when we don't know the provenance of the company. We don't know its stability, uh, how stable it will be. So th these are things that the, that the West really has to, this is a moment to reflect on as we come together and as these new tidal flows of foreign direct investment come out of China, 
into countries that are open. These are the questions we really do have to start reflecting on. These are the risks we didn't that you expect mentioned before, it. We right? didn't expect it that such a huge player with such a decisive market, an irreplaceable market such as China for every major company in the world, um, would not play by our rules. We didn't foresee that 15 years ago. So this is really different. They have kind of a leverage now in, in economic diplomacy that we also, we had never dealt with a, an entity like that before. So Japan, South Korea, they were minor <laughs> players compared to what China represents today. And this is uh, something that um, changes uh, actually the, the rules of the game presently. So we have to adapt. It's impossible that we just leave the door open without any yeah, well, countermeasures. So, so we have to adapt. Both of you say politics uh, have to do something. We have to uh, put on pressure for a level playing field. But how? What exactly? What leverage does the West, does Europe, does the US well, have? Well, you know, before you answer the how, it's, it's important to remember that the reason why the moment that we sit at now, historically speaking, is so significant is that we have had a presumption in the West that the US and Europe and Australia, Japan and China were heading in a generally convergent direction. Now, that was the whole logic of the World Trade Organization. You set the rules, China will slowly reform, will, will be brought into the global system of governance. We now, I think, have to conclude that both in domestic terms within China, but also its regimen uh, in terms of global practices are becoming more and more divergent. It's even worse. Rather than convergent. Because we don't have industrial policy, active industrial policy, for example, for the digital transformation. There's a lot being done, but it's not comprehensive. It's not long term. China has it. They have a very comprehensive, uh, long-term, very active and well-funded industrial policy in those realms. We will have to have one, because otherwise we will be just overrun mm -hmm. in these regards, in many ways. And this is something that we focus, our institute focuses on presently. It's really what is going on in the, in the realm of digital transformation. It will, won't be possible to respond to Chinese dynamism in this area without having policies in place. It's impossible to handle this onslaught just with open markets. This is naive. This is really evidently and existentially naive. We can't afford it. Yes, so it's really new. So we are forced to develop industrial policy, even if we don't like it, if we, even if we don't have the tradition. We have to do it. I think most European countries do not even have a review process exactly. for, uh, for judging whether uh, foreign FDI it runs counter not to their national interest but security interests. The US does have one uh, and there's a great deal of interest in, in that uh, American. That process. was a big question. And it's the being built robotic, up. It's uh, being ro built up, actually. Right? Right. right. This was the trigger last year, KUKA, which is an interesting case uh, acquired by a Chinese private company that is well run, that has the funds to do it. Um, this is a different case, but this triggered a, a major debate, policy debate in the European Union, actually, because it's kind of a crown jewel, one of the top level robotic companies in Europe. And um, so we will have, it's, it's been in preparation, you probably read it in the, in the media also, that um, the European Union has concrete proposals now on the table for an extensive investment screening process that um, will change the rules of the game. Just to get back to my question from before, you seem to say that we should take some action, but what exactly can we do? What exactly can Europe, the EU, Switzerland, the US? Well, I think there's a review put process some leverage there's concerning open market mm. that the EU is now discussing, and uh, I think presumably will enact some form of them. I think in the United States, there's only one grounds on which an investment, because we are an open market. Uh, can be turned down, and that is of national security. And there are very few that get turned down. But the review process often has many Chinese investors fear as they eye a merger and an acquisition that they will run into this process. And as there is discussion that it may look a little bit uncertain, they withdraw. But the, the, the review process doesn't actually uh, uh, repudiate the, the deal. So, but this is one of the many moments, uh, many sort of examples of how China's rise, its new dynamism, its new wealth, its new forward policy in the world, I think are challenging uh, societies that, particularly those governed by liberal democratic orders. Let me we, try to make one point clear, because this is now seen as kind of a, some people, these, they, they kind of, uh, frame it as kind of a Chinese conspiracy. It's not. 
they are very open about it. It's just the Chinese interest in becoming a world leader in certain um, really important technology areas, in industrial technology areas. So it's absolutely legitimate to go for that goal. So they do it by different means, and we are so far not equipped to respond to those means. That's what I mean. It's not a conspiracy. They are actually writing things down. We have policy documents down to third level task force level that spells out what the goals of uh, the Chinese external industrial policy, external requirements um, are, uh, acquisitions are. So that's uh, something that's not secretive or so. We are just so far, we have been way too passive and way too blind in a way, or uninformed simply, to respond to it. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a very naive question, and uh, I do have a hidden agenda about it. Let's assume that the European Union uh, tries to, to stand up to this, to, to, to get will, policies will. into mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. to stop this, or not to stop it, but to regulate it, to, mm -hmm. to ask for transparency. If Greece would vote against it in the Council of yeah. the European Union, well, the, the, would this surprise you? No. Why not? Because, the, 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 again, uh, China has been incredibly <laughs> astute about finding countries, and Switzerland is one of them. China is making a, a special friend out of Switzerland because you're not in the EU. So you're going to have a special relationship with China. It wants to kind of, uh, with, with yes, uh, Switzerland with China. It wants to sort of pull Switzerland off into its orbit. It's done that quite nicely with Greece. And then when you become beholden, you have an interest to protect. And then China gets to, to, to you, you want to respect their views. You want to respect their, their, their political interests because it becomes your interest and you don't want to be punished if you go against them. So, so what's the deal with, uh, with Greece? That's the voting rules are decisive on that. So on external economic policy, Greece's support is not necessarily needed. Actually, it would, be needed, it would be needed for having a resolution um, on Chinese behavior in the South China Sea or on Chinese behavior in Hong Kong. There, um, the Greek and Hungarian support would be needed for the resolution, but not necessarily in all cases of um, foreign external uh, economic relations. So that's a different um, game, actually, that's uh, played out there. But what happened exactly? Why is Greece so on the Chinese side in general? For China, that's. I mean, they are very smart. That's clear. I, I, actually, I, it's easy. I mean, you don't well, need to. Port, right? You don't need to control the whole EU. You don't need to control the whole Southeast Asian Association of Nations. You need to control veto positions. So, if you control Cambodia and Laos in, in the ASEAN, it's enough. If you control Hungary and Greece in the EU, it's enough to block the most <laughs> unpleasant resolutions that they could pass. So, they are very smart at that. Well, you ask me. The port. Yeah, the port. I mean, sure. it's a big, a big investment. So sure. now they have a port in Greece, and they own Syngenta in, in Switzerland, and they, they own AMC movie theaters. I mean, what happens, uh, for instance, and I asked this to the, our Secretary of Commerce, what happens when we wake up one morning and the Chinese have bought CBS? You know, nothing to prevent them from it. You can probably get it for a song these days. It's not worth much, <laughs> but what happens when you wake up one morning and you, your news on American television is being uh, run out of Beijing? There's no provision to stop that. Listening to you, I get the impression that uh, like a storm is coming or something and nobody's realizing it yet, right? You know, I think what lies behind the concern that you're hearing from Sebastian and myself uh, it's not an unfriendliness towards China. Indeed, we've spent our lives trying to promote better relations with China. But it is a recognition that we have different values and different political systems. That means that the interests, when it comes to matters of the common wheel, insofar as countries pay attention to the common wheel, uh, is quite different. And we don't, we should not be naive about that. Let's, the picture is even bigger, I think, presently, because there's an opportunity for China, clearly, and it, it wants to use it. It's um, a weakening of the West. It's a weakening of the US. And so it's possible to have many um, empty spaces, many voids that you can move towards. So the whole, we will talk about that probably still, but the whole Belt and Road Initiative is such, a, um, such an initiative. It's built on the voids, on the empty spaces that China can Go move on. towards. 
It's not, um, the US is not there. They don't confront the US in, in Africa. Yeah? They don't confront the US in Central Asia or not even in, in Pakistan. So that's the places where they go. It's actually a very um, sensible way yeah, to deal with these things. So what we see presently, and this is the bigger picture, just to, to, to throw it at you, um, it's clearly a kind of um, dissolution of what we called the West. So this is something, it's a concept we love to use as a shortcut actually in our arguments and our interactions with China. But what I see presently, and this is partly driven by um, um, the US administration presently, it's accelerated by it, not driven, it's accelerated by it, but also by what is going on in the EU to a certain extent, is that this kind of unity, this unifying value system and then, well, system of interests is actually presently slowly but steadily um, dissolving. And that's uh, clearly, there are spaces there, there's room for Chinese initiatives. And the concept of Eurasia connecting those huge economic spaces in East Asia and Europe and mobilizing economically the societies in between, this is a super huge concept that actually breaks down the old concepts. And, and this is beyond Europe, it's beyond Asia. Yeah? This is the new world, the new map that um, China would like to see. And this is something we have to take seriously. You know, it's really what we took for granted, what we have taken for granted in the past um, um, is presently seriously weakened at the core of it. I'll take this ball and I'll play it over to you, Mr. Shell. The Belt and Road Initiative, this plan, it's, what is it for now? It's more a plan than reality yet? An initiative, they call it. An initiative yeah. to invest heavily into uh, many countries, uh, also, you mentioned Perez already. In your view, what is the ambition behind this? What's the rationale? Well, I think there are two things. I mean, this is an extraordinarily ambitious plan that is the signature sort of plan of the president of China, uh, Xi Jinping. And I think it, it has two kind of very general goals. One, of course, is his commitment to what he calls the China dream. And a large component in that dream is the question of making China a great nation again. And to be a truly great nation in this world, you need to be global. And China has a kind of a shape memory from that period of the great Qing Empire when it, it was the center of the universe as it knew it. And it would like to get back to some commensurate position uh, in, in the present world. So that, that, that's one thing that has deep historical roots. It's, 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 it, 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 is a, it collects nationalist sentiment, patriotic sentiment. I think every Chinese feels proud of what they've accomplished and what they've accomplished is extraordinary and would like to see this written larger and larger and larger in the world. The second thing is that as China has engaged in all of these stimulus programs to keep its economy going through funding, through loans, uh, uh, infrastructure pr programs which keep its, uh, its uh, rate of development up around 6%, 7%. Uh, it can't keep doing that. So one, the way, one way it keeps going is it creates these projects abroad. To which, invest. To, to invest, invest. Which, which will use Chinese steel, concrete, aluminum, know-how, engineering, and labor force. So it's a way to sort of export to, to expand your domestic market, if you will. But the result will be, and that's a big project, one of the very rare expansionary projects we have in world politics presently, is that China establishes itself as the hub of a new transnational economic structure. And this is a big thing. It changes the economic map of the world, actually. And this is not just about infrastructure and industrial um, um, manufacturing uh, networks and so forth. It's also about big things like uh, the world reserve currency. This is now important to Switzerland because clearly, to the, from the Chinese perspective, it's not acceptable that um, the US has this um, undeserved, uh, huge privilege um, to um, have the uh, kind of a monopoly on the world reserve currency and can um, raise debts in its own currency abroad, worldwide, things like that. This is something that has been attacked, has been attacked actually in the IMF um, um, context already openly. And um, this is going to be a, a really important thing also for Switzerland now, concretely, if this happens, if China comes with investors, comes with its, its companies to Europe, and also comes with its currency to Zurich, to Zurich here, then um, it would mean this is a huge, a super huge transformative opportunity. 
Because if this new world map, world economic map, comes into being, yeah, evolves into something that's viable, only parts of it, it will be a game changer also for Switzerland, for all financial places and hubs in the world. Okay, that's the second storm that's brewing tonight. But it's a positive storm in a way. It is. Yeah. Could be a very positive one. Mm -hmm. How? Because it's a, a huge expansion of business, a diversification of business also, maybe, maybe even a diversification of risks in the world currency system. So this is something that I would see more positively in a way. Yeah? So, so these Chinese projects, and they, t they are taking a lot, they, can, they are taking on a lot of risk, the Chinese. Yeah? So they are shouldering most of the funding of those Belt and Road um, um, initiative projects. And many of our companies are benefiting heavily now already. Here in Switzerland, it's ABB, obviously, the big engineering firms, but GE in the, in the United States, Siemens in Germany. They are having already really huge projects, more than it was last year, I don't know, it was, was more than one billion US dollar each on its balance, yeah, due to Belt and Road projects. So the business is there already. Yeah? But of course, uh, one has to ask, uh, is this whole expansionary vision built on sand or built on hard rock? And uh, then you get into an analysis of the Chinese economy. And, uh, you know, I'm not an economist, but I think you don't need to be an economist to understand that when things grow as rapidly and often as chaotically as China has, uh, you have to be very careful in your due diligence because uh, it, 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 it's not a foregone conclusion. I don't predict anything dire, but it's not a foregone conclusion that this will have staying power and durability. So a lot of these projects may end up with some, uh, you know, some some difficult. I really like your critical view, but I also like the positive turn that the let's let's the just concretely. Stone. If the Pakistan, so there's an may I? No, just, go ahead. Just one concrete yeah, test ahead. stone in a way. Yeah, it's just some some test for the um, efforts. It's Pakistan clearly. They are planning a China-Pakistan economic corridor and investing 50 to 60 billion. That's what the projects are. It's very difficult, as you know, due to the security situation, due to other issues, the regional politics and so forth. But um, if, this, if they manage to mobilize only parts of the Pakistan population, economically, I mean, let, let them take part in the, in, the, in the globalized economy and then China's consumer-oriented economy, this will be a huge boost. This will be an add-on to the world economy because Pakistan is a large state with huge potential but not much performance so far. So let's, this is something, if they manage this, this will be yeah, a signal to the world. Of course, there are reasons why other yeah, people have not ventured to go absolutely. into that market. And there are severe risks also for Chinese. Yeah. There are many Chinese are being killed on, uh, the, uh, on, on construction sites, things like that. It's and we shouldn't and, uh, forget, Sebastian, that yeah. one part of this belt and road is right through the South China Sea and the Straits of Malacca. And the South China Sea, as you all know, is this giant protuberance that hangs down from the South China coast all the way to Indonesia, claiming every island, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines. And this is a, a, a very bold kind of uh, a claim. And the Belt and Road, uh, this is... Uh, goes through it. Goes right through it. And who can stand up to China and the South China Sea? Well, China hopes no one. All right, we'll let but that besides stand. the US, we'll I have stand. to say. And I'd like to try to focus, try at least to focus on the upsides. To, tonight's panel's title is Rivals, Rivals, Allies and Friends. I have heard much about rivalries and not so much about alliances. So let's focus for a minute on one policy realm where the alliance between Europe and China is very important. And this obviously is climate change. China has changed the stance on climate in the last years. It has opted to uh, accept CO2 li limits. It has opted to stay in the Paris Accord, even when the US have uh, pulled out. Mr. Hallman, uh, some say that a big part of China's stance on this is driven by its own problems with climate change. Would you agree? What are these problems? Exactly? Well, they are pressing domestic problems with the environment, so applying to all sorts of environmental degradation. For the political business. class or right. for and everybody? No, the political class everybody. feels the heat. And this is clearly one of the priorities. You see it in the run-up to the party congress that there are two issues are always top priorities, surprising to Western public. One is elimination of poverty by 21. This is one of the 100-year goals in China. 
and the other is um, eco it's environmental right. protection, really, and climate yeah. um, issues. So this is really top priority, and it's being pushed, actually. They have now in investigation teams sent around in China that are so intrusive, that are so forceful, that they are cutting some supply chains now presently. Yeah? So some companies are being closed that are essential to joint venture company supply chains now. So there are letters already being written to Chinese government. So, so they're, it's really serious. They are really tightening down presently on polluters. And this is a complicated business as we know. But this is, to my um, knowledge, it's really credible. We had one large um, um, Chinese-German conference on, on um, climate policy cooperation in July. This is certainly the policy area that's the most collaborative, the most collaborative with, with China. Your, open doors, with open ears, they are really um, collaborating. Would you agree or do you have, no, again, I critical uh, I would, and I think in the last 10 years, that, that I, I've actually uh, done a lot of work in this area and I've seen a remarkable transformation of China's policy towards recognizing that it has an interest in remediating the climate problem. Mm. I would say there's been a rather tragic uh, aspect of this, though, and that is caused by my own country, mm -hmm. that uh, under the last presidential administration, climate change had become sort of the keystone of the whole Sino-US arc. It was the area that, where, as you pointed out, we were getting along. And we had a good relationship, and it was a win-win uh, recognition of common interest. So when President Trump came, pulled us out of Paris, put all these climate deniers into office, we lost the one area where the two countries really had something in common and could dig in uh, and, and, and build some musculature of collaboration. And so one of the interesting things, and I won't get into this in any detail that has happened, is that as a result of Washington's absence, uh, President Xi has quite smartly recognized that certain states like California, which is the fifth largest economy in the world, where there's a governor who wants to be a president and is treating his state like it's a nation, he's signed agreements with California. He's had an hour-long meeting with Governor Jerry Brown six weeks ago, and the center of that collaboration is climate, energy, and clean air. Wow. That's really, but let's go because it's not okay. the only. It's not the only area, clearly. No, but, there are others, but yeah. what, what you just said now, uh, and again, bad news from you, sir. You said that the, the Trump decision to pull out of Paris, and I have never realized this before, is actually goes much further in damage. Yes, it's not just climate change. It's the relations. the Sino-U.S. relationship, it's the most important in relationship general. in yeah. the world, was it's weakened because well, of this. Climate totally decision. collapsed by it. I mean, in the climate Trump policy. does not have a China policy. He doesn't. No, I mean, what is it? It's, okay. It's, 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 maybe I'll go to China and hug it out with Xi Jinping and get a deal. I don't know. That's <laughs> as good as I can see. And tweet about it. And tweet about it. Yes. But, but <laughs> in Europe, with the same rationality, it would mean that the relationship is getting stronger because the climate issue, our interests are very much aligned. That's an issue area where this is really going well, I'd say, so far, diplomatically at least, on a diplomatic level, but clearly those economic issues that we have are intertwined, you can't separate them. So no. they are usually coming up in the same, yeah, in the same meetings. And um, let's face it, China is contributing 30% to global growth. So Switzerland and Germany, they benefit tremendously from Chinese dynamism. That's the fact. So our businesses, our companies, they have to be there. They have to benefit. We have to collaborate um, because we are dependent on that dynamism. But concerning the alliance on climate, has this already had concrete effects? Have we seen steps that have been taken because of this alliance between Europe and China at least? Oh, we saw Paris. Right, keeping the climate agenda alive is a thing. Okay. Because if um, Europe and um, China wouldn't step in there presently, it would collapse. So there wouldn't be a multilateral climate policy anymore, to be very frank. So this kind of leadership now, um, um, European and, and Chinese together in the climate policy is really essential to keep it alive, this policy area. I'd like to summarize uh, tonight's discussion uh, under the question whether China really wants to become the global power. It's the global power it seems to become. But be before we do that, I'd like to have a look at domestic politics because this is, uh, will be in the news mm, in the next right. couple of weeks and months. The 19th Party Congress will happen 
in, uh, when is it, in a, in a month from now, in October, middle of October, and it is exactly. expected that it will bring even more power to, um, to Xi Jinping. What are your expectations, Mr. Shell? What do you expect of this party congress? Will it empower Xi Jinping even more? I mean, I, I think that... Or is it just impossible to say? Well, it's very hard to read these tea leaves, but I think you can assume that the dots all aim in that direction. That Xi Jinping has, has gathered great power uh, in his hands. In the previous uh, uh, party general secretary, Hu Jintao, there was a sort of notion of prima inter pares, of a collaborative, collective leadership, and that no leader would, big leader would step forward the way uh, President Xi has. There's no doubt about it. He's been very bold, very, uh, very effective, and has garnered much greater uh, uh, authority and power for his office. Uh, and the question, I suppose, one of the big ones uh, at the party congress coming up is, will he appoint a, a designate a successor, which is standard practice, five-year terms. He's had his first five years, so now if the past is any uh, guide to the future, he would designate someone who would be in waiting uh, for five years hence. If he doesn't do that, which I suspect he won't, uh, it may mean that he, he intends to stay on longer than the 10 years that the past two uh, party general secretaries have had. And you expect he won't? I he expect he won't longer. because I think he, he feels he's not completed what he has set out to do. And he assumes, and I think he's right, that if he appoints a successor, he immediately becomes a lame duck. And if there's anything Xi Jinping does not become Xi Jinping is a lame duckness. Mm. What do you think? He will be the strong man. It will be a, a new kind of period in Chinese politics, I'm quite sure. So there's an un, he will be uncontested as the leader for the next five years at least. And he will go for different kind of policies also. Because the, basically the, the, the people sitting on the standing committee of the Politburo will all be his men. So there's nothing to fear from them anymore. That's what I would suspect, and uh, this will change things. It will narrow um, developmental options for China also. So very importantly, leaders uh, from Deng Xiaoping in the 1980s to um, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, they had an open-ended kind of um, understanding of Chinese reform and opening. They didn't know what kind of system was at the end of the thing. It was really experimentation. They were trying things out, exploring things, working together with, with the West, and even studying social democracy under Hu Jintao in the, at the party school. Impossible today, because this man, Xi Jinping, knows or, where claims, he wants or to go. claims to know yeah, where China has to go. This is more like, again, it's like de more deterministic yeah, in a way. It's, it must become a leading power and the, the documents that the party Congress will likely spell that out. We have the preparatory documents mm -hmm. already in place. And this is a different stage. It's really about not about catching up anymore. It's not about justifying China's position in the world anymore. It's now about leading. It's now about giving, about providing concepts that solve problems for the 21st century. And China, China will be in a leading, in a determining position for that. This is a completely different game now. So this leader is a different category from all the ones that we had after Mao. And yet, uh, despite his, his eagerness and pretensions to want to lead the world, this raises the very interesting question of soft power. Of uh, What are those components that make a country uh, a, a, a seductive leader, a leader that people are willing to, f to follow elsewhere in the world. So he, he, here, once we get, in my view, back again to this vexing question of a very different political system and different values. Because in order to lead, you have to want more than just someone's money. You may take their money, but that doesn't mean you're going to be a faithful ally. So if you look around China's borders, I think there are 14 countries that border China, with the exception of Russia, which I would call a very fair weather friend, not a friend to be relied on historically by China or vice versa. Uh, China doesn't really have any, any dedicated allies. It has a few client states that will- They don't want allies. Well- Putin, they, they don't want allies. 
So they want friends, they want countries, neighbors that are friendly in a way, but allies, no alliances. Well, they don't go for alliances. I would say That's they, the, op the, the contrast with the US, you know. Yeah. We don't build alliance systems like the US. Well, right? I'm not so sure that if a good they say ally that. came they around, say that. Right, they, exactly. they would yeah. issue it. Yeah. Uh, but never mind. Uh, the point is that if you're going to live in a neighborhood, if the US had Canada and Mexico at war with it or not, or pretty hostile, it wouldn't be a good situation. So this is a big challenge for China. It wants to be. Uh, an ascendant power to regain its stand, status, at least in Asia and also in the world. But who are its friends? There are many opportunists around him. <laughs> so that's not, not exactly friends. But if, no. you, if you take a look at um, ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, you find Cambodia, you find Laos, you find the Philippines now recently, you find Thailand, that are very friendly, at least the political elites, yeah? These, these they kind tend of to be very friendly, very friendly to, to, towards China. So they have a way there, they have leverage there. Mm -hmm. They have that's leverage right. there. Yeah. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. I'd like to mention something that you haven't. Uh, if she's getting stronger in the next five years, what will this mean for the crackdown on, crackdown on political freedoms, political rights, uh, personal freedoms that we've seen in China? Will this get worse? Will this get even worse in the next five years? Because you, sir, for example, you've been not so pessimistic about it. You've recently argued that it could turn around again, that it could get better again? Well, of course, it always could. I, I think if, if you followed, uh, as I have over the last 50 years, the waxing and waning of openness in China, you would be forced to conclude we are in a, a period of, of rather extreme uh, waning of political freedoms and a, and a very stark increase in political controls of all kinds. Uh, in fact, a hearkening back in certain very, I think, worrisome ways to, to sort of the, the Mao era. Uh, now, the reasons for that, fears of instability and, and just who Xi Jinping is, but uh, again, it raises the question of how stable a country can be when it is governed with such uh, uh, an intensity of control mechanisms. I think it can be very stable because, and we didn't touch upon that so far, technology is a game changer for top-down authoritarianism in China. Big data and artificial intelligence will help this system, will support this system, not just through public surveillance, which is everywhere now, and online surveillance, which is everywhere. You are being seen if you say something or do something that is incompatible with the power of the Communist Party now. It's really a very broad and expanding net now. So this is really really something different. This is not a just Leninism or, or Communist Party system as in the past. This is, I sometimes call it digital Leninism or IT-backed authoritarianism. This is a new kind. It's a new animal, really. It's evolving into something completely new because it's it's really supported by those most advanced technologies and they are actively and purposively making use of them. And this will give them stability if they want. It will give them control down to the personal life level, the lifestyle level that they never had before. This is fearsome from the Western point of view, but it's for all authoritarian leaders, it's the perfect world. I, I don't disagree with Sebastian on this. I do think that the level of uh, sort of nouvelle authoritarianism which we are seeing uh, arise in China would, uh, George Orwell wouldn't recognize it. It's, it's a definite uh, uh, evolution. It's much more granular, it's much more fine-tuned also in many ways. This is really, if it's, it's really something special that's building up there. We are tracing that very carefully at the Institute's one of our focuses and um, technology-driven um, changes also in the, in the political system. And this is really, um, we are not prepared for that with our old assumptions about authoritarian rule and so forth. This is really a new ball game. This is new. I do think, though, that all of the things we've been talking about, of course, rest on one principle alone, and that is whether uh, the Chinese Communist Party can continue to deliver economic growth. That is the primary source of legitimacy of the whole government. And that is a high wire act. And we, as we all know, most economies in our experience, and I can't think of any would defy this rule, are cyclical. And the real test of any country, as we've learned in the West, is when an economy has a downward cycle. Then it 
depends very much on other sources of legitimization in society. And I think if that happens in China, uh, that's going to be a, a, a test that... Uh, but that's what Xi Jinping and Wang Xishan made their reorganization efforts for, that the Communist Party must be able to withstand a major economic crisis, because it couldn't in the past, that's true. But the idea is we have a very disciplined organization in place that will withstand any economic shock, even a financial crisis, even a real estate market crisis that might happen actually, which would be dangerous. That's the part. Where would it, how could things play out if it goes badly actually in China? I would expect that a real estate market correction by, of more than 30 to 40 percent would really, um, um, really make people extremely nervous and unsatisfied. So this would probably be a cause for unrest in the middle class because most of the wealth of Chinese households is now based on, on real estate in many ways. And, and this is something that we have to uh, be aware of. So there are risks there, but so far, I must say, over the last two years, I'm surprised how kind of refined their, their countermeasures, their regulatory efforts have become in the financial system and also in the real estate market. They are constantly guiding and pushing and, and yeah, really trying to, to fine tune their, their activities. It's really uh, also, it's, it, they have become much more sophisticated at that. I, mean, I think one does have to take one's hat off to the economic management yeah. of China. Right. It's been very astute. And we've had 30 years of rather constant steady growth. So, but with that recognition, we also need to remember there are other elements that will play into China's economic health, such as the fact that we live in a global world and what happens in one place affects what happens in another. So it isn't purely the autarky, the self-reliance that we had under Mao Zedong where it didn't really matter what happened outside of China. It was a, 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 a unitary system. So I think, this is another question. What happens if the, if, if the world economy goes to blazes? China's or or less, less dramatically, if uh, there's a coordinated interest rise, rise of interest rates in the US and in Europe. Mm -hmm. Might happen very soon. This will give tremendous pressure to China in terms of capital controls and capital outflows. Then. So this simple thing that central banks might decide to, to raise the interest rates in the next few months actually already, step by step, might give a serious problem to China already. So this is how, how the global economy works. So we and, are it's beyond, and it's beyond their control. Yeah. It's beyond yeah. Chinese control. Yeah. Yeah. Since you've already answered my question whether China seeks a global role, you said yes, obviously. Absolutely. I'll just follow up with this little question. What do Chinese citizens think about it? Are they, uh, is this something they seek or is it just the economic prosperity that they're happy about, as you just said? But the global leading role, is this something There is no Chinese think? citizen that represents no. all the... I mean, we, we just did a, um, a study of ideas and ideologies, so clusters of ideas are in the social media in China. And what would emerge from that was really difficult quantitative research, social media. It emerged a pluralistic society in China. So we have all sorts of positions, political ideas, positions from really from, from liberals to communists to fascists, even very small. Yeah? So really national, violent nationalists, I call it, I'm harmless, yeah? violent nationalists, they want to start wars and things like that. So you have everything on the, on the, on the, on the web, actually, in the social media. So you, what, what um, we have to see is that Chinese society is much more colorful and much more pluralistic than, than, than the Communist Party would, 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 would like it to have. Yeah? Mm. And still you say the communist rule should, uh, will, will stay stable even if you have all this colorful... It's not organized. It's lifestyle issues sometimes. It's okay. personal and, and predilections and, and preferences. But it's not about being organized. Organization is impossible. All right, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. I'll ask you one last question. If you would advise the new uh, federal council that was elected today, that will probably be foreign minister by Friday, we don't know yet, what would you advise him on China? After all this that I've learned mm -hmm. tonight, after all this that maybe I think you're as fascinated as I am, what would you advise him? Well, I think there's some great opportunities for Switzerland, uh, but I think Switzerland's going to have to go in with their eyes wide open. And, uh, you know, uh, $44 billion is a lot of cash, but uh, it comes with a lot of other hidden strings, and you better better sharpen your due diligence knives when the Chinese uh, M&A people come to town. <laughs> Mr. Hammond. Switzerland has a special role. It's, it's precious 
from the Chinese point of view, because you have this free trade agreement, and this free trade agreement is meant to be a pilot project. It's meant to be the showcase for a functioning a free trade agreement with Europeans. If it works well, it can be expanded to the European Union, perhaps in the future. So this is a test. It's kind of a, a really I'm important pilot. And I'm it's really a pilot project that must not fail from the Chinese perspective. So this is a, an opportunity for Switzerland. This also gives you some leverage, by the way. Yeah, Maybe you should use that more actively in some <coughs> cases here. But um, it's really something that, um, that gives a special role to, to also to Swiss economic diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis China. And the other thing clearly is you have to build up capacities to, to see through Chinese um, investors and plans and schemes and industrial policies. It's, really, it's, it's possible to do that. It's work. It's hard work. But it's possible to see through much of it. And this is something that's just the basic homework we have to do now in the future. Thank you so much, you both. I'd like to open this up uh, for discussion with you all. I'm sure you have lots of questions. There, this, Mr. in the back. Maybe we can have some light too for the room. Thank you. Um, I <coughs> actually like to ask two questions, if you permit. Introduce like, yourself. Someone. First Will one. You introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Gabor Fuget. I'm from Credit Suisse. Um, <coughs> first question would be more a political one. Um, what would happen if? this could happen um, if one of those immensely rich um, entrepreneurs um, is becoming politically um, uh, targetable for the Communist Party and uh, we've seen these things happen in Russia, um, we've seen how Mr. Xi Jinping has uh, persecuted some of uh, the tigers before. What will happen if one of those entrepreneurs uh, is becoming targeted or um, eliminated? How will this reflect? on China and how, on the perception of China in the West. And second question, do you have any idea what will happen in Nicaragua in the next oh, years? Oh, the canal? You mean the canal, okay. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. start with Nicaragua. Well, uh, with Nicaragua, well, who knows what's going on in Nicaragua. I mean, there, I as, as, as some Can of I? you may know, there was one of these entrepreneurs who had promised to invest billions of dollars in Nicaragua to build a new canal that would compete with the Panama Canal, it would go in, into Lake Nicaragua and across that way. But as I understand it, uh, there was a good deal of protest against it because it was going to give China, it was actually going to give them a, an essential colony in Nicaragua where they would own the land, I think for 100 years, they would be able to put up resorts, whatever the heck they wanted to do there along the canal. Uh, but I think also the entrepreneur who had put up the money seemed to head into some heavy weather uh, financially, and it's very unclear what's happening at this point. I recently met an investigative journalist who, who did a report on that. It's, um, they are kind of stuck presently. And the other, the issue is also that Panama, the Panama Canal has been widened and deepened to have those super large cargo and, and to, to ships now to, to handle this, and so the competition is uh, it's probably not competitive anymore. Mm -hmm. As a commercial project, it's not uh, probably yeah. working. That was not, question. not that that would stop them from doing it if there were other reasons. Right, right. And it was a private company, a strange company oh, that's yeah, working yeah. on that. And the other is the, you mean if Jack Ma would be persecuted or something, yeah? Like, like such a, such a yeah? celebrity. Mm -hmm. Now that would be a shock because these are international uh, listed companies. So this would be a shock for financial markets. And one of the largest companies in the world, IT companies in the world, this would be really something that I would not advise the Chinese government to do. They won't do it like that. I mean, what they do presently is because they want to control over these super large ecosystems that Alibaba represents, Tencent represents, and so forth. Um, so they, they, want, they have now started to, to encourage them to merge or to have stakes in state-owned telecoms companies. This would be the, word, the way to handle it. Yeah? Kind of indirect control of super large private players that are not fully under Communist Party control. And this is in the longer run, no, in the medium term, is certainly not acceptable from Chinese economic, from the standpoint of Chinese economic policy, that ecosystems, infrastructures, actually IT infrastructures within China are not controlled by um, the state or not, not even indirectly controlled. This is not satisfying. So there will be changes, I'm absolutely sure, yeah, but they won't probably, um, the celebrity managers and entrepreneurs like Jack Ma are not likely to be, to be hit directly. This would be a shock, really, to the, um, concerning the, the trust in the Chinese IPOs. Yeah. Some uh, entrepreneurs have already had a bit of, uh, 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 of trouble. Uh, <clears throat> the head of Anbang 
the head of uh, Fu Sun Guo Guangchang. Uh, there's well, a he's, he's free now. He's, he's free now. He yeah, did disappear yeah. for a week, mm. uh, and it was a little unclear where he went. He collaborated with the authorities. Uh, uh, what yeah. happened? I mean, it, it's. There, let's just put it this way: there, there are sort of echoes of uh, uh, of trouble which do send a frisson mm. of uh, worry through the other entrepreneurs, put them on notice that they exist at the sufferance of the party. You know, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Uh, they understand that. Next question. Thank you. Karen Munyaini, I have a question going back to the more friendly level, I guess, after rivalry and allies. I was wondering whether you think some of the um, more socially or outwardly directed exchanges, associations such as cultural um, foreign student exchanges, tourism, some of the medical collaborations, the artistic installations and programs are actually well intended or are they also sort of somewhat manipulative in this whole scheme? That's a very interesting question because it, it presupposes the, the uh, viability of the notion of engagement. And that if you believe in engagement and that the societies are sort of converging, as I noted earlier, then you want to have all sorts of uh, uh, different kinds of connections, not just state to state, but civil society to civil society, cultural museums, all of these other things. Um, I, I think it's really important that we continue to engage at this level, but I do think it's also uh, important for us to be realistic about what is happening around the edges. There are a lot of people who really do cherish that kind of interaction, who do are very humanistic, who love culture, who love education, one thing or another. And I think it's completely justified to have those kinds of exchanges with China, but not to assume that if we just send more ballet troops, we're all going to love each other uh, up, up at the summit meetings. That's not going to happen. And I think a certain amount of new realism is, 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 would not be uh, 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 wasted. There's one thing, a terminological change, that is kind of telling. It's now called people-to-people -people exchanges today from the Chinese point of view. What we called, used to call civil society exchanges. Civil society, the word is not welcome in China anymore because it's a Western kind of um, submarine term, yeah, because it's a term that undermines um, the relationship, the interaction between state and, state and society in China. So people to people means, and this is something, please pay attention to it, because it's now the Western governments are not paying attention to it. They are using the word. They are using the Chinese term now, people to people, dialogue, people to people um, activities, engagement. And in the end, who is there at people to people conferences? Please pay attention to that. It's Politburo members and diplomats and no civil society anymore. So the name change has actually importance there. And this is something that I see everywhere and I warn against it, please don't accept this people to people format because it's something different. It's really state organized, state orchestrated and controlled exchange. So terminology says something, tells us something there. This is something that I really see everywhere now, people to people formats. This is, please see who's there and you know what's going on. And it's notable that um, whereas in the past several decades we've seen a growth in civil society activity, of NGOs, universities, think tanks, cultural groups, now with the new NGO law in China where every in foreign NGO has to reg register with the Public Security Bureau and has to have a, an official partner, we've seen an incredible strangulation of the ability of particularly uh, civil society organizations from liberal democratic countries to have a full-bodied relationship with counterparts in China. And in my own view, this is very pernicious because it, 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 it deprives our countries from an ability to interact at a non-state level. In the front? I'm on the way. <laughs> Thank you. It was Lostenberger. Um, for me, one of the puzzles of today's evening is that we state that um, China is overregulated, controls everything, 
face recognition, gets prisoners at a beer party, and so on and, and so forth. Yet, our answer is that we have to devise an industrial policy. Which... No, that's the response to the industrial policy, not to the surveillance system. <laughs> yeah, no, right. mm. For me, we, this is the wrong conclusion. We're going down the same path. Mm. I think we have the better mm. system. We should believe in our system. What do you say to it? I can't have an argument with people who believe in something. That's really difficult. I mean, this is uh, a difficult thing to do. I also believe I support clearly, and I was trained to see it that way, as you do, and I support this view. Yeah? So it's really about also defending our own systems to a certain extent. Absolutely right. Yeah? To at least to stand up and to, yeah, to, be, to, to, to maintain, to sustain what we have achieved. And this is important, but we have to see the threats that are coming. And sometimes if you respond to challenges, not threats, but necessarily it's challenges like an industrial policy, you have to really devise the instruments, hopefully only for some, some passing yeah, period, to, um, to respond to that. So this is an industrial policy. It's more obvious to me. But in surveillance system, no, it's, it's, less, it's more nuanced. For example, there are now really powerful traffic management systems in China being built up, are being installed already. And they are driven by big data, they are driven by artificial intelligence, by deep learning structures already. They are really moving very fast there. These systems of management, of traffic management, they, they serve to prevent collisions. They have a more, a much more faster flow, traffic flow. They can, these systems, I tell you, they will be exported to other countries and other urban centers. They do it now in China, it's scalable in China, and many urban centers need those traffic management systems. And it's also the preparatory stage for the so-called autonomous driving of the future. We need those technologies installed in the public space, all over the place. But what are you doing with it? Because this is multi-purpose technology. You analyze traffic flows, good, no problem. But at the same time, and I saw this a software demonstration of that, it's really, you analyze all kinds of rule, <laughs> rules violation. You have, at the same time, you have reports to the police that automatically are automatically done, yeah, without any policeman involved, actually. Yeah? So these are things that I fear, I must really say, that we have, we can't really um, establish the limitations, the constraints to keep these things apart in the future. So if you want to, and you're probably right, to prevent those installations in the public space, in the end it won't be possible to have autonomous driving or e-mobility at full scale, because these technologies, they will come together in a package. This is something that I fear, and we are really doing lots of research presently, what is going on there, sometimes, some, you know, these technologies can be very good and very helpful in some cases, but they can be, yeah, they have a multi-purpose, yeah, so you can do very bad things with them. And our societies will have the, um, the difficulty, but the te absolutely the mission, actually, to keep these things apart. Yeah, the promises of the technologies and the threats that come from them. And in China, you have both in one technology. And this is uh, in one, one plan, actually, for that. So this is something that I see actually beyond even the control of the Chinese government, because these technologies have a life of their own now. Yeah? Mm. You know, in spirit, I'm completely with you. And I have to say that at my stage of life, uh, I find it rather discouraging that in many ways, this country that I've spent my life on should be moving in certain ways in a retrograde motion. And that it is now, uh, in my view, uh, 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 could have dire implications for us within our society. It used to be we just thought it was a question of what went on over there. So I think um, we have to prepare ourselves. We have to be realistic about this, that this isn't simply uh, our system is best and prevails and it's, it's good in the face of it. We are in a state, I think, of some decline ourselves. And it's not a, it's not, it, it's not, uh, it does not go without saying that we will prevail unless I think we uh, make an effort and are very realistic about what's happening. This is, it's not the Cold War, but it's something else happening now where there is a competition between two very different ways of doing things. One last uh, simple question from the lady here. <clears throat> Sorry, 
My name is Natalie Bau and I would be very interested to hear um, maybe something short about Taiwan and Hong Kong because they're obviously part of the China dream and um, economic delivery of the part of Chinese government will not be sufficient, I think, uh, if Hong Kong and Taiwan do not want to be part of the China dream. Where do you think is the red line? Will China risk a war for that purpose? What do wow. you think about this? That's not a simple question, <laughs> but we'll try it. Hong Short Kong, answer. Hong Kong is difficult. It's a different um, case also. So what we have in Hong Kong, it's now part of the People's Republic of China. So there is no separatist um, option actually. Uh, in, in, by international law, there's none. But there's one important thing. The United Kingdom has an international treaty on Hong Kong with the People's Republic of China since 1984. This is the Joint Declaration that gives special status to the Hong Kong, to the Special Administrative Region, until 2047. It's a protected regime, they call it, based on international law, but the treaty partner is the UK, and the UK is damned doing nothing presently. They are the only ones that have, they are entitled actually, that are authorized to do something about what is happening in Hong Kong, and they are completely passive. They don't even comment. They don't even comment. They do it internally, but not, um, so this is something that's actually a shame. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy, because they could do something. And China now starts to argue, as the South China Sea, there is no international law involved. It's wrong, because the Joint Declaration is deposited at the United Nations. It's an international treaty. And the UK doesn't activate it. This is a tragedy. This is weak. You know, when it comes to questions of sovereignty, and of course, in China's view, Hong Kong is Chinese territory. And in fact, by Britain's acknowledgement, that is true, with special status. And by uh, uh, Beijing's uh, uh, notion, so is Taiwan. Uh, and I think the quaint notions of self-determination don't apply in Beijing. They don't recognize that. So I think it's going I think Taiwan is slowly going to be like a, a cake of ice melting in the sun. Uh, that seems pretty clear, and nobody will step up to, to, to avert that. No one who can. Taiwan's another question, and I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. The, the U.S. does have some commitments there. And the political reality, as you probably know in Taiwan, is that people are, the, the mainlanders who rule Taiwan are out of power. The party in power now is made up of people who were born in Taiwan, who were there for generations, don't view themselves as Chinese. And they're viewing themselves less and less as Chinese as each year passes. So there's a kind of a contradiction uh, of a, a very antagonistic nature in the making here. That's unfortunately all the time we have. Uh, thank you so much, the both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.